Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Minority Report by Philip K. Dick. So, I'm going to be honest, it's a little bit misleading, because I didn't know going into it, but Minority Report is basically a short story, so it ends about this far into the book, and then all of this is other short stories. And yet they've gone with, you know, film by Steven Spielberg and the movie cover, but uh, anyway, I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through some of my flags. In the future, crime can be prevented. The Department of Pre-Crime has cut major crime by almost 100%. How? Simple. It is possible to look into the future and then arrest potential criminals, sentence them and punish them before they actually commit the crime. Nobody doubts the efficiency and fairness of the system until pre-crime commissioner John Anderton finds himself accused. According to the department, at some point in the next seven days he will commit murder. In most cases, the pre-crime verdict is unanimous. This time there is a difference of opinion. If Anderton is to save himself, he must find the minority report. And if he is to remain free, he must go on the run as a convicted murderer. Philip K. Dick's brilliantly original vision of the future is the basis of Steven Spielberg's blockbuster movie starring Tom Cruise as John Anderton. So yeah, nowhere on that does it mention that it's a 40 page long story. But hey ho, why didn't they call it Minority Report and other stories? I don't understand. Anyway, so the stories we have in here, we have Minority Report, Imposter, Second Variety, War Game, What the Dead Men Say, Oh to Be a Blobal, the Electric Ant, Faith of Our Fathers, and We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. That latter of which was turned into Total Recall. We also have an introduction here by Malcolm Edwards. There's not too much I want to share with that. So let's jump straight into the title story, Minority Report. So here we get a little bit of context in how this is, uh, how the, pr the future predictions come in, basically. They have precogs, which are basically, I would say, they're like autistic savants who are, like, basically wired up to a machine and just constantly make these predictions. And, um... They have three of them, so uh, so it says here, The system of three precogs finds its genesis in the computers of the middle decades of this century. How are the results of an electronic computer checked? By feeding the data to a second computer of identical design. But two computers are not sufficient. If each computer arrived at a different answer, it is impossible to tell a priori which is correct. The solution, based on a careful study of statistical method, is to utilise the third computer to check the results of the first two. In this manner, a so-called majority report is obtained. It can be assumed with fair probability that the agreement of two out of three computers indicates which of the alternative results is accurate. It would not be likely that two computers would arrive at identically incorrect solutions. And so it says here, uh, Una unanimity of all three precogs is a hoped for but seldom achieved phenomenon, Acting Commissioner Whitmer explains. It is much more common to obtain a collaborative majority report of two precogs, plus a minority report of some slight variation, usually with reference to time and place, from the third mutant. This is explained by the theory of multiple futures. If only one time path existed, precognitive information would be of no importance, since no possibility would exist in processing this information of altering the future. And this becomes important later on. And um, yeah, Anderton, I believe it's is it his wife, I can't remember already, but um, she, she says, uh, it says, leaning over, she stubbed out her cigarette and fumbled in her purse for another. Which means more to you, your own personal safety or the existence of the system? My safety, Anderton answered, without hesitation. You're positive? If the system can survive only by imprisoning innocent people, then it deserves to be destroyed. My personal safety is important because I'm a human being. And furthermore, and uh, basically, she wants the system to remain up, so she pulls out a pistol to threaten him with. But I'm also like, well, why does he then do what she tells him to do? Because he was the commissioner in charge of the minority reports. So if she was going to actually kill him, it would have been predicted in a minority, re in the majority reports or whatever. And then she would have been arrested for it before she had a chance to do it, which means she can't kill him. But then there is a lot of, you know, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff going on. And so basically it is quite interesting because the whole concept here is that the reason that the, the minority report existed uh, was that basically had looked into a version of the future in which the policeman himself it's very difficult to explain it and then he does eventually end up committing the murder as well but for a different reason and uh it was pretty good but also i think you could see the twist coming although i may have seen minority report i don't remember then we have imposter imposter was okay that actually also had a predictive predictable ending it's because he's kind of trying to do these twists and i don't know i just find in general it when authors try and do stories with twists in them it's really obvious what they're trying to do. And so, I mean, that's why I don't tend to like, you know, contemporary thrillers that much, I guess, because the, 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 the twists are just so obvious. But anyway, here we're moving on to second variety. Um, 
And this is basically about some different types of robots, I guess. And there's a war between the Americans and the Russians. I just thought this was quite interesting as well. Uh, this, we explain what happens here as well. Uh, uh, how they got to this point where the Americans and the Russians are at war with each other. Hendrix put out his cigarette and hurried on. It was interesting, the use of artificial forms of warfare. How they got started? Necessity. The Soviet Union had gained great initial success. Usual. It means usually, it's just a typo. With the side that got the war going. Most of North America had been blasted off the map. Retaliation was quick in coming, of course. The sky was full of circling disc bombers long before the war began. The discs began sailing down all over Russia within hours after Washington got it. But that hadn't helped Washington. The American bloc governments moved to the moon base the first year. There was not much else to do. Europe was gone, a slag heap with dark weeds growing from the ashes and bones. Most of North America was useless. Nothing could be planted, no one could live. A few million people kept going up in Canada and down in South America. But during the second year, Soviet parachutists began to drop. A few at first, then more and more. They wore the first really effective anti-radiation equipment. What was left of American production moved to the moon along with the governments. We have another typo here. With all four of us armed, one of us might get to your command bunker. Except they've spelled four. F-O-R. I don't know if you can see that. I mean, considering this is published by Galanx, who are, you know, well-known science fiction publishers, you would expect there to not be two typos before you hit the first hundred pages, you know? And then we get this interesting thing, basically there's the second variety of robots and nobody knows what they look like and we've got these kind of four survivors all huddled together and one of them kills another one of the survivors because he says he thought that they were the second model of robot and then people turn on this other guy being like, well maybe you killed him because he knew that you were the robot and you wanted to silence him. So it's all very interesting. Hey Biggie, are you going to help me do the rest of this review, are you? Yeah, so uh, we're talking about Minority Report, yeah? Top, good lad. All right, so um, where were we? We are on a second variety here. Yeah, we have, basically this is, there's like different types of uh, robots that look like different people. And basically my criticism for this entire collection really is that you can tell that Dick is trying to put twists in all of them. And so you see them coming because you know. So basically these people have found like type one and type three robots but they don't know when the Type 2 is, and they think they've discovered the Type 2, and then it turns out the Type 2 is actually a Type 4, and there is still a Type 2 out there, and it's the person he trusted and sent off to the moon base. But it's like, well, no shit. It was, like, obvious as soon as... Like, it was, one of, it was kind of annoying because there are about five or six different characters that you could suspect of being this Type 2 or whatever, and it was really obvious which two people were both robots. Okay, then we move on to war games, and actually I did enjoy this story, but I don't have a whole lot to add to it. Basically, um, this company is like testing these like alien inventions, and they're really worried because there's these soldiers that attack a castle, and the soldiers keep like disappearing into it until there's only three left, and then two left, and then one left, and they're not sure what uh, what it's doing. But there are some other games too, and these soldiers end up like they don't get shipped or whatever, but they do take this game that's a bit like Earth Monopoly. It's called Syndrome. And, um, yeah, basically it says here, uh, Behind him, the two children continued to play. As stock and money changed hands, the children became more and more animated. When the game entered its final stages, the children were in a state of ecstatic concentration. They don't know Monopoly, Hawk said to himself, so this screwball game doesn't seem strange to them. Anyhow, the important thing was that the kids enjoyed playing Syndrome. Evidently it would sell, and that was what mattered. Already the two youngsters were learning the naturalness of surrendering their holdings. They gave up their stocks and money avidly, with a kind of trembling abandon. Glancing up, her eyes bright, Laura said, It's the best educational tool you ever brought home, Dad. So basically, you know, it's teaching them to be good little consumers, I guess. Uh, here we have what the dead men say, and basically in this world, there's like a half-life so people can be brought back to life after their death. We have this little bit here, uh, Sarah Bell said softly, Nil nisi bonum. He glowered at her, not sure of what she had said. Some foreign language, no doubt. Sarah Bell had a college degree. And it's like, it's Latin. It's clearly Latin. Latin is like the easiest language to notice. I mean, it's a bit like German as well. Like, Achtung, nein! You can just sort of, it just sounds German. Et le français paraît Actually, speaking of French, here um, we get uh, this conversation. Hey, Johnny, Sarah Piss had said once. How come since you're so bright you never went to school? Everyone knows that's fatal nowadays. Self-destructive impulse, maybe? He had grinned, showing his stainless steel teeth. Moodily, he had replied, You've got it, Lewis. I want to die. I hate myself. Which in French would be, Je vais mourir. Je me déteste. Which I know because, 
Nirvana has a song called I Hate Myself and I Want to Die. And I've been learning bits of French by like getting lyrics that I like. So, you know, I hate myself and I want to die. And I hate myself and I want to die is Je me déteste, je vais mourir. And so we have this conversation here because this guy can't be brought back to life. And uh, Gertrude shivered. Imagine not coming back, how dreadful. But that was the old natural condition, her husband pointed out as he drank his martini. Nobody had half-life before the turn of the century. But we're used to it, she said stubbornly. We get this uh, little bit of masculine domination here and <laughs> this guy has got some fairly worrying views. I mean, this was written in the 60s to be fair, but it says, um... so someone asked him, how do you think you'll get along with her? I don't know, he said candidly. I'm not even sure I'm going to try. He did not like the idea of working for a woman, especially one younger than himself. So not only does he not want to work with a woman, he doesn't want to work with someone who's younger than him either. This very old school way of thinking. Just work for whoever's the best leader, mate. Or in her case, I mean, her father owned the company, so now she's the majority shareholder, so... Fucking man up, you know? Or go and get a new job. <laughs> and so, yeah, this one's quite political as well, because there's like this re-election happening, and uh, Kathy says, Do you think Gam has a chance this time? No, not really. But miracles in politics do happen. Look at Richard Nixon's incredible comeback in 1968. And again, this was written... When was this written? What the Dead Men Say. What the... What? Copyright 1959? How can... Okay, so... Okay, so he was just predicting the future, I guess. Not realising that Nixon would actually go on to become the president. Which is kind of interesting. And also, obviously, he couldn't predict that Nixon would get impeached either. Which, again, is also interesting because at the time of filming this, today is the day that news broke that Donald Trump got impeached, even though nothing's going to happen anyway because politics is broken. Doesn't matter. Politics broken in the UK as well. And in France. And in, like, fucking everywhere. India. <laughs> Just everywhere is broken. Then we have All to Be a Blobble. And basically, this is a story about like this r romance between these two people the blobbles are like this alien race and there was a war between the humans and the blobbles and um, basically people infiltrated the blobbles by like being turned into them but then they kind of got stuck so they had no control over it and kept turning back into blobbles at inopportune times it's very good to be honest and uh, we have the electric ant and uh, this story was all about this guy who discovers he's a robot and then he can kind of tamper with reality by sort of changing this tape that he's got running through him. Again, these were all written in like the 1950s, 1960s, so it makes sense that the robot, or that he thought of robots as using tapes, you know? Okay, and this guy, another character, also has another troubling point of view here. Um, of course, his personal secretary, if only for job considerations, would be hovering close by, mothering him in her jejune, infantile way. All heavy set women like to mother people, he thought, and they're dangerous. If they fall on you, they can kill you. I'm separating the artist from the art here, though, so I'm assuming that he just wrote characters who were dickheads and that Dick wasn't a dick. Didn't mean to say that like that, but it came out like that and it worked all right, didn't it? I did like some of the references to different brands. So here we have a at home in his one room apartment, he poured himself a shot of Jack Daniel's purple label, 60 years old, and sat sipping it. And uh, yeah, I just thought that's cool because obviously Jack Daniels has stood the test of time and is still going strong. We have uh, Faith of Our Fathers here. This is kind of set in a like communisty future. It wasn't great to be honest. Um, it wasn't one of the strongest ones anyway. But I did think this was interesting. Basically this um, homeless man's trying to sell something to the main character, Shen. Anyway, the peddler said quietly, but comrade, you must buy from me. Why? Shen demanded. Indignation. Because, comrade, I am a war veteran. I fought in the colossal final war of national liberation with the People's Democratic United Front against the imperialists. I lost my pedal extremities at the Battle of San Francisco. His tone was triumphant now and sly. It is the law. If, re if you refuse to buy wares offered by a veteran, you risk a fine and possible jail sentence. And in addition, disgrace. And actually, I can imagine that being passed through as a law. We have another just brand reference here. We have a reference to Lipton Tea, which was rather cool. And there are a few bits here I want to read out as well. So um, there's a reference to John Dryden. The writer of the paper, Miss Culper, had selected as her text a portion of a poem by John Dryden, the 17th century English poet, final lines from the well-known A Song for St. Cecilia's Day. So when the last and dreadful hour, rumbling pageants shall devour, the trumpet shall be heard on high, the dead shall live, the living die, and music shall untune the sky. Well, that's a hell of a thing, Chen thought to himself bitingly. Dryden was supposed to believe, anticipated the fall of capitalism. 
That's what he meant by the crumbling pageant. Christ. He leaned over to take hold of his cigar and found that it had gone out. Groping in his pockets for his Japanese-made lighter, he half rose to his feet. Uh, and then the TV starts a broadcast, and uh, it says, With a groan, Chen rose to his feet, bowed the mandatory bow of response. Each TV set came equipped with monitoring devices to narrate to the SECPOL, the security police, whether its owner was bowing and or watching. It's very Orwellian, you know? And then, towards the end, we have We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, which is what Total Recall is based on. And actually, the short story, it wasn't that interesting. It was all right. They must have added to it a lot to get a movie out of it. The same with Minority Report. Like, it was just... Because it was a short story, it was strange knowing that they got a movie out of it because the story was just over, and I'm like... Because I don't really remember the movies that well. So I'm like, how did they manage that, you know? But all in all, I mean, Dick's writing's still pretty well done. He's uh, got a lot of interesting ideas. And it's one of those where, although I kind of saw the twists that he was going for coming or whatever, um, I still enjoyed the stories. I still enjoyed a lot of the ideas he had. Some of the stories drag more than others. But overall, I am glad I read it. And uh, I gave it a four out of five, believe it or not. I feel like I've been quite negative with it because it's because the second half of it had nothing on the first half. So uh, let me just quickly look at the stories. So obviously Minority Report, the title story was pretty good. Um, Imposter was okay. Second Variety was okay, but obviously the twist was super obvious. War Game was really interesting. What the Dead Men Say, it was pretty interesting. Oh, to be a blobble, that'd be good if you're kind of interested in more than romantic sci-fi, I guess. I mean, it had elements of romance to it, but also it shows you like a family falling apart, so that was good. And then, yeah, the last three were probably the worst three, including the fact that one of them was what my, my, was what Total Recall was based on. So there we have it. That's what I thought of Minority Report by Philip K. Dick. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.